to Zebrahim Karimi. Thank you, Jeff. And so uh, it's, it's very difficult for me to talk about photons at the front of Bob. So I'm, I'm going to reveal the other side of Bob Boyd, so, which is a recent uh, progress that we, we perform and with several experiments that we've done during the last uh, five years on electron beam shaping and application of the electrons. So I decided to not talk about photons. Yesterday I talked about photons, and today I'm talking about electrons. So they have some similarities. So uh, before going to, to massive particles, I want to just tell what is the structure like. I know that Bob likes, likes the scientific discussion, so I'm reviewing, re, uh, reviewing some of those nice works, and I'm sharing with you as well. So uh, 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 the structured light was extremely useful and was a successful field. And many of the people in this audience, they contributed to this field of research, including Miles Paget and Bob Boyd. And if I want to uh, simplify in one slide, I would say that uh, it's extremely good and it gives you the possibility to do classical communication. So you can do uh, multiplexing. You can do optical microscopy and you can enhance the resolution of normal optical microscopy with the stem microscope technique even by, by two order of magnitudes, uh, one or uh, roughly speaking 20 times. And you can do optical manipulation. So yesterday we talked about Nobel Prize, so Arthur Ashkin. And you can do high dimensional quantum computations because it, it, the alphabet that you have it is infinite dimension. And you can even do quantum computations in the Hilbert spaces. So those are the good points with uh, structured light because they give you infinite dimensions and you can implement a high dimensional quantum computation or let's say telecommunication, et cetera. So, but uh, let's, go, let's go to do some simple, simple calculation and look at the, uh, the, the quantum regime when we deal with matter. So for example, we can talk about electrons, we can talk about protons, or we can talk about neutrons, or we can talk about person. So all of them, they are quantas. So what we need to describe them is a wave function. We believe that everything is quantum in the world. And this wave function, you can make it very complicated if you go to a relativistic regime, or you may make it very simple, and in this case, it's a non-relativistic regime, and I'm considering that it's a free particle. So the obvious solution is a, a plane wave to this uh, Schrodinger equation. But I'm saying that to you, uh, let's not solve the equation in Cartesian coordinates, but let's solve it in cylindrical coordinates. And one of the obvious solutions, again, is Bessel beam. And if you look at the Bessel beam, it has exponential of I L phi, which these I L phi will give you, for those people that they are in community of orbital momentum, it's a symbol of orbital momentum. So it means that even if you have a massive particles, these massive particles in the quantum regime, without any potential, essentially you can create a beam of them which they carry orbital momentum. And that's extremely interesting. I mean, these exactly, under, I would say, undergraduate level quantum mechanics. So <clears throat> you can make it very complicated, but I can look at the, these uh, uh, waves, and I can plot what is going on with the phase of these waves, and the phase will be some sort of helical shape due to the ex existence of exponential of IL phi. So in this case, you can see for the case of L equal to zero, zero you will have some planar wave front, and for the case of L equal one and plus one, you will get helical wave front, which people you are familiar with. How can we create these sort of beams? We are talking about massive particles. The first thing that we learn from Soskin, though he didn't talk about orbital momentum, he was talking about phase singularities, is using holograms which has these sort of phase singularity inside. So you can go with what we call a pitchfork hologram, or you can go with spiral phase plate, or in this case, for the case of electron, which has a charge, you can go with, a, with simulating magnetic monopole. And when you send electron through these devices, you will get a diffraction pattern and if you look at the diffraction pattern, you will see that there is a sign of the donut shape, which case orbital momentum. If I want to excite you with, with, with the physics here, 
Assume we are all familiar with orbital momentum, and we, we, we look at the LZ eigenstate, LZ uh, eigenvalues for the atom, uh, for electron in the atom, assuming that this is an electron which you take away the, the nucleus. So you have a free electron, which case orbital momentum. So <clears throat> how, why, why we care about that? In electron microscopy, usually what you do, you send an electron which has a certain wave function through a material, and what is happening, uh, assuming that you don't have uh, inelastic interaction, you will get electron uh, uh, wave function which is gaining a phase upon propagating through this material. And this phase essentially is given by electric and magnetic property of the material, which essentially is given by A potential or phi potential. Okay? So this phase essentially has some information about the material that you are sending the electron through. So if I can be able to analyze this phase, then I know what is going on with electric and magnetic property of the material. So you can expand, uh, expand this phase in terms of any complete basis. For example, we love orbital momentum. You can expand them in terms of LG basis, and you will get certain coefficients. And what is important for you to understand these certain coefficients coherently. Or you can expand it in terms of Hermit Gaussian basis, and again, you will get uh, expansion coefficient. And again, the same story. If you can understand what is going on with CPL or CMN, you, in, you know exactly what's going on with the phase. And from the phase, you know what's going on with electric field and magnetic field inside of this material. So what we tried, we tried to build up a sorter, which gives you the possibility to sort the orbital momentum for electron beams. So we generated this sorter, and you can look at the scales, and the scales is, they are about two microns, because the special coherency of the standard or com commercial electron microscope is about 10 micron. And uh, what we did as a trial, we had a magnetic dipole laid on in the, in the plane, and we sent electron beam through this, around this dipole, and these electron beam, uh, electron beam, they gain a phase, and this phase, as I explained, it's given by the electric and magnetic, uh, magnetic field of the, the dipole. And then we look at the, at, at the expansion coefficients, and we got these data. And as you see, that the curve shows the theoretical prediction that we had it, and quite they are matching. We are talking about nanoscale uh, regime. So this has been done with Bob Boyd, not with photon, but with electrons, and my colleagues in Italy. And we may ask why we care about electrons, because those people, they, look, they work in electron microscopy, they know that there is no spin polarized electron microscope. So there is this lack of technology in electron microscopy. And that's a big, big, big challenge. So they don't have spin up or spin down in electron microscopy. They give, you, give them a mixed state. However, if you look at the, look at the uh, uh, current uh, uh, density of the electron, of course, is an electron is a wave function. You, you can look at, the, look at the ensemble of the electrons, and you will, what you will see, you will see a donut shape, and you can assign what's going on with the current distribution, and the current distribution will be azimuthal one. And surprisingly, you will have an azimuthal current and this azimuthal current will give you a magnetic moment along propagation direction in the form of a spin, but is unbounded and is quantized. So it gives you L mu b of magnetic moment along propagation direction. And that's extremely useful for electron microscope people because they don't have a spin, but they can use orbital momentum instead of that. So what we tried, we tried to, to, to use it for, for, uh, 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 for some, uh, revealing some materials property. And I'm giving you only one example. And assuming that you have an electron which is passing through a transverse magnetic field, what it will be the action? It will be Lorentz force. The electron beam will be de deviated. If the magnetic field is along y direction, it, it will be deviated in an orthogonal way. But if the magnetic field is along z direction, the Lorentz force is zero right, we cross B will be zero, then I'm asking you how can I reveal this magnetic field? It turned out if you do a calculation and this electron carries orbital momentum, of course it doesn't touch the material, 
But upon propagation, it gains a phase, which is a, some sort of, I can, I can say that it's some sort of a Harnobohm effect, which is given by the L, the value of L, and it's given, given by, 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 by the flux that electrons experience during this propagation. So at the end, you can, you, you can try to do that. So we created a, a, a magnetic uh, needle, which has 1.1 Tesla at the center. So it's really high magnetic field, but of course it's a dipole. If you go to, to uh, far away from this distance, you, it goes when divided by r power of uh, uh, two, uh, the potential. So we try to measure the uh, uh, to build up an interferometer and measure the phases. And from the phase, we try to understand what's going on with the magnetic field, and we got exactly one Tesla. So 10% of the error. Read out tilting the sample. So you can use electron beams which they carry orbital momentum to reveal uh, a, a magnetic property of the material. And that was the first time that people, they can see the two-dimensional magnetic field in electron microscopy. So then uh, after a, a couple of years, we saw a paper. I think, can I reveal that? I think Bob, you know, uh, is a family. Bob was, I think most likely Bob was a reviewer. Probably Bob was a reviewer. We know that Bob was asked to write news and views. So most likely they will ask reviewers to write news and views. Okay. So yes, all we know. So they, 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 what they did, they created twisted neutrons. So they had a neutron beam called neutron beam, and they had interferometer. And from the interferometer, what they claim, they claim that they create neutrons which they carry orbital momentum. There are huge debate and questions about the. The, the experiment because the spatial coherency of this beam is about 20 nanometers and the beam size is about two centimeters. How can you get orbital momentum from incoherent light? That's a question. So when we, when we saw this paper, I asked it myself and I went to Bob and I say, Bob, why, why do you want to do twisted neutrons? And Bob says, that was his immediate reply to me. Perhaps we love OM and I say, okay, Bob, I, I, I love OM as well, but there should be something really new there. And then uh, we, we try really to think, and we say, okay, we can twist orbital momentum, we can twist photons, we can twist electrons, and for electrons and photons, it's very clear for me what's, what I gain. But for neutrons, it doesn't have a charge, right? I don't get any, any magnetic field, okay? And I'm not using it for quantum communication. I'm not using it for quantum computation. What, why, why it should be useful? I w we were in Banff, and on the way coming back, I, in a plane, I was reading a paper, and suddenly it came, an idea came to me. If you look at the neutron, neutron is a quantum object. It makes of quarks, and of course we have no idea about how they set up together. It's a cloud of uh, a quantum cloud, they are set together, but if you move the neutron, when it moves, you will break the symmetry. And what is happening, this will become a look like a pancake, which at the center is negatively charged, and at the periphery is positively charged. And the radius is that these charges oscillate depends on a form factor which is given by GE and GM and no one knows what is this radius. There are many many theoretical calculations about that, and people, they claim that it's this radius or that radius. So I say, okay, fine. We don't know what is going on with the charge density distribution on inside of neutron. Let's twist it. And we did a lot of calculation, and the end, what it turned out, yes. If you twist the neutron, what you will get, you will get magnetic moment. And this magnetic moment is constant and is order of 10 power of minus five mu, uh, let me see, the magnetic moment of a neutron, which is mu n, which, because the, the mass is changed. So, and the conclusion was that, instead of looking for this radius, what you can do, you can twist it, you can measure the magnetic field, and from the magnetic field, you understand what is the radius. So, that was, that was, I mean, people in, in uh, high energy physics, they appreciate that, and uh, uh, we were proud of this, that we could, we, could, uh, we could convey this message to the people. So, 
With this, I will conclude my talk. And one thing that I learned from you, Bob, I will, I will share, I'm sure that Jonathan has the same experience. So, uh, because this is a common experience between Jonathan, myself, and Bob, when we went to Iran together, we have fantastic time, right? And you, you, you were in, in the room of king, right? And that was the room of king of Iran at that time. Shah. Yeah, it's Shah. And Bob says that, oh, Shah was so poor. <laughs> Because there were no furniture there. They, they took everything. Okay? But one thing that was fantastic there, it was on the way going to Iran. You know why, Bob? Because we wrote a manuscript in a plane <laughs> together. Right? And uh, it was so funny because Bob was sitting in two rows far away from me with Diane, and I was in another, another row, and, uh, and there was a lady between us, which we passed the computer to each other. <laughs> each half an hour or one hour, we passed the computer to each other, and finally the lady says to me, do you want to switch the space, the, the seat? I say, of course. <laughs> and I want to tell you that uh, what, was the, what was this paper? Oh gosh, it was Popper, Carl Popper paper. I lost the track of the revision that we had. So if you look at the revisions, you see that is version 1, version 2, version 3, 17, 18, 19, 20, 22. And in other places, I'm sure that I have the rest. But if you look at the other side, which is Popper with Jonathan, which we passed to each other. And it was draft 11, draft 12, PNAS, uh, Processing of National Academy 0, and etc. And finally, version 23, I found there. But what I learned from you, Bob, we should never give up. And, we, and we were, when we received the comments from reviewers, this morning you say that, okay, you receive embarrassing comments from reviewers. But I learned from you that I should go two steps back, think about two weeks, and say they were comments from my colleagues. And definitely they are valuable. And I have to make the changes in such a way that appeals to all people. And that was this paper. It turned out from those top level journals to to be Journal of Optics. We don't care where we are publishing. What we care is the best science, doing the best science. And people, they asked me to play the trailer again. It's one minute, and I played the trailer. Oh. There's no wish. <laughs> 